The Witcher 3 is a very big game. In fact, it's an enormous game, and this left CD Projekt Red with a problem they needed to solve during its development. How do you introduce a game as vast in scope as The Witcher 3 is without overloading players at its very beginning? Well, the answer comes in the form of the game's introductory sequences and why tortured, and today I'm going to run through them in more detail and examine why they're so expertly designed. If you enjoy the video, do consider liking, subscribing and all that other good stuff, and now let's take a closer look. To really appreciate the genius of The Witcher 3's opening, it's best to start at its start. The game begins, as most games do, with an opening cutscene. It's relatively exciting, but there's not a whole lot to note. Except for the items dropped by Yennefer that Geralt and Vesemir stumble upon. I'm not going to talk about them anymore for now, but do try and keep them in the back of your mind for later, as this won't be the last time they're mentioned. After the cutscene, we see Geralt fall asleep, and the scene cuts to his dream in Kaer Morhen. If White Orchard is considered by most to be The Witcher 3's tutorial area, then this brief section should be thought of as something of a pre-tutorial, a chance for players to learn basic story elements and gameplay mechanics in an area devoid of any real threat. In terms of story, what's important to note here compared to later in the game is what characters talk about, or rather, what they don't talk about. Because despite the huge universe The Witcher 3 is based in, dialogue during this segment focuses entirely on what's going on at the time. There's no mention whatsoever of climactic events of past games or books, no references to characters only those familiar with the series would understand. Instead, every single line of dialogue is focused entirely on the moment at hand, and on informing players regardless of experience as to exactly what the relationships are between the different characters they meet. Across the following few conversations, players learn that Geralt and Yennefer are romantically involved, that Geralt and Vesemir have been training Ciri, and that Vesemir is the patriarch of the group. There's no long-winded exposition about events long past or previous adventures, just a singular focus on who the different characters are and what they mean to each other. This is brilliant because it not only stops The Witcher 3 from falling into the trap of becoming story-heavy from a very early point, but also because it's very clearly written with accessibility as its core consideration. Players who have prior experience of the series may know more about the world by virtue of what they've already played, or indeed read compared to those coming in blind, but there's no information shared during this section that new players won't understand just as well as series veterans. Because the flow of information making its way to players is so carefully managed through this scripting, by the time this section concludes they will have a solid grasp of the basic relationships between the characters involved, and be ready to learn more about the wider world of The Witcher 3 when they leave. And we'll see very shortly how the game continues to do this as things open up further. The way the story is gradually expanded upon, the way it's presented to players in manageable chunks as the game builds towards fully opening up, is mirrored in terms of gameplay as well. The drip feed introduction of gameplay mechanics to players during this section is a fairly standard affair, but like the way exposition is fed to players, it's also very sensibly designed, predominantly because it gives the game time to get the basics out of the way before exposing players to much more open areas. They get a chance to get to grips with movement and the Witcher Sense mechanic in the bedroom, a very enclosed space, before the scope of movement is expanded upon and the difficulty increases ever so slightly as they race Ciri through the grounds of the keep. And after that, the section ends with combat training, which again introduces players to new mechanics as they continue to progress. Finally, once combat is over and players leave Kaer Morhen, it becomes clear that the way the game's mechanics, and indeed its story, are gradually introduced to players is also symptomatic of how The Witcher 3 increases the scope of its world. The game opens with players taking control of Geralt in a room to learn the basics, before they move to the castle grounds as they become more confident. After that, they then progress to White Orchard for their first taste of the open world, but in a more manageable setting, and are then finally let loose on the much bigger areas of Velen, Novigrad and Skellige. But before we leave Kaer Morhen, there is one last thing I want to touch on, the relationship between Geralt and Ciri, and how it's used in a particularly clever way throughout this section. During this first visit to Kaer Morhen, players are of course the mentees, so to speak. They need to learn the ropes and develop a firm understanding of the fundamentals, such as movement and combat, so that they're well equipped with everything they need to take their first steps when they enter the open world. But The Witcher 3 also throws in a twist on the idea of the tutorial in the way that players, while remaining mentees themselves, also act as mentors at the same time through Geralt's relationship to Ciri. The game does this by framing much of the learning experiences that take place during these early stages less as players needing to learn the ropes, but rather as Ciri needing to learn them, with players, through their own learning experience, simply aiding in Ciri's learning process. It serves to make what absolutely is a tutorial feel much less like that's what it is, and it goes a long way to ensuring players still feel like Geralt, a seasoned Witcher, even if they are still getting the hang of everything themselves. 
A few moments later, following the dream's climax, players find themselves back in Temeria, where it's time for the training wheels to finally come off. The next conversation between Geralt and Vesemir moves the plot on further again, and much like Ker Morhen, the dialogue is intimately tied to a central aim without straying far from it, in this case, setting up players' objective for White Orchard of finding Yennefer. There's no superfluous dialogue, no unnecessary exposition, other than a brief mention of a saucy encounter with a unicorn, simply a focus on making it as clear to players as possible what their immediate goal is. Straight after this conversation, it's time for the first real combat encounter, as a pack of ghouls ambush the pair of witches. It's a simple encounter, requiring little more from players than the ability to attack, but it's placed where it is for a reason. Without it, there would be a significantly longer wait for the game's first combat encounter, and so by placing it here, CD Projekt Red ensures players have the opportunity to get better acquainted with the combat mechanics almost immediately after learning them. Despite happening in an altogether different place, think of it as almost an extension of the combat training which took place in Kaer Morhen, a skill check to ensure players have remembered the basics. This encounter also marks the point at which The Witcher 3's story begins to open up a little more, as evidenced by the conversation between Geralt and Vesemir on horseback shortly after. The pair discuss the wider political ramifications of the recent war, and King Radovid is mentioned for the very first time, and from here on out, there will be far, far more world building woven into almost every conversation. After the short horse ride, which even itself is a continuation of that drip feeder mechanics I alluded to earlier, the Griffin makes its first appearance. While the Griffin may appear to be simply the first of many weird and wonderful beasts players will encounter during their time with The Witcher 3, it also serves a very specific purpose. The Griffin is used to set up an almost entirely self-contained story arc for White Orchard, and gives this section of the game a definitive beginning and end. The hunt for Yennefer is the overarching goal, but slaying the Griffin ensures players feel like they have accomplished a great deal even by the time they complete White Orchard. It appears at the very start, and it's slain by the very end, which gives players the satisfaction of completing a fairly large task, and minimises the risk of them experiencing our princess is in another castle syndrome, that is, the feeling nothing major has actually been accomplished, and that they must now simply continue what they were doing, but in a different location. There's not much to say about the short bit of dialogue here, although we will go back to the choice Geralt is offered regarding payment in just a tick. You'd... you'd like a reward, I suppose. You don't owe us anything. You were in need. We helped. Upon arriving at the nearby tavern, a conversation with the innkeeper ensues, and it's at this point I want to focus quickly on what Vesemir says. Now, the aldermen don't use the privy without asking the Black One's permission first. And, seems they hanged the Lord. So no contract. Shame. We might have done something, but not for free. This is a missed opportunity. At this point, players have already had the option to choose not to ask for payment after saving the villager from the griffin, and so it would have made a lot more sense for Vesemir's comment in the tavern to have come at some point before that scene with the griffin. In that order, players would have felt more like they were choosing to be their own witcher after hearing Vesemir's views on taking payment for their work. It would have given them a chance to go against the grain, and would have also made the difference in outlook between Vesemir and Geralt, depending, of course, on what options players choose, much more obvious. It's far harder to make that connection looking back, when the choice has already been made prior to Vesemir making his comment, and so in my view, having that comment come up before the scene introducing the Griffin would have made a lot more sense. Much like the journey to the tavern is used to expand on the world of The Witcher 3, so too is the rest of the tavern. Players learn about the state of the world, the somewhat uneasy feelings many harbour about witchers, and there's even the opportunity to learn how to play Gwent, the hugely popular card game which now even has its own standalone title. It also introduces Gauntero Dim. He's a character who wasn't that important at the time of The Witcher 3's release, but his appearance here ahead of his later introduction in the Hearts of Stone expansion is a nice touch, an evidence of just how much forethought CD Projekt Red put into every little detail. Before players are finally unleashed on the open world, there's one final skill check to get through first. If the ghoul encounter earlier was a chance for players to master the very basics of combat, namely how to attack and deal damage, this encounter with a group of soldiers helps ensure they also have at least somewhat of an understanding of blocking and countering as well. And with that fight out the way, that's it. Geralt's now free to explore the world as he sees fit. The game continues to expand its scope, and players are free to head in whichever direction they see fit. They've done the narrow corridors of Kaer Morhen, the more open grounds of the Keep, and now they have an entire part of the world to go out and explore, 
Now, you can never tell exactly what direction a player is going to head in when they have the entirety of an open world to choose from, but in the case of White Orchard, it's likely most will next stumble upon the town's notice board, the first of many they'll encounter across the hamlets and villages they visit during their time with the game. And after studying the notice board, it's also likely that the first quest they embark on will be Twisted Firestarter, which appears on the map as a yellow exclamation mark a few metres away. After all, what better way to guide players towards a quest you'd like them to tackle early on than with a trail of yellow breadcrumbs in the form of the notice board followed by the exclamation mark? Twisted Firestarter is a brilliant quest, especially so given it's probably the first most will tackle in The Witcher 3. It begins by giving you the setup, which is a relatively simple one. Willis, the town's blacksmith, has had his forge burned down, most likely by disgruntled Temerian townsfolk who are angry because he's been forging weapons for their enemies, the Nilf Guardians. In keeping with much of what I've talked about so far, this quest is used to continue expanding on the game's mechanics, in this case Witcher Sense, which players are then tasked with using across a much larger area compared to the bedroom back in Kaer Morhen when they were first introduced to it. And, after a short search, players find the culprit, a villager named Nap. Up until this point, the quest has been a fairly straightforward one. Talk to Willis to understand the problem, and then solve it using Witcher Sense. But it's upon finding Nap that things get really interesting. Players are offered two choices. They can turn Nap in and leave him to be dealt with, as is the law, or they can turn a blind eye in return for a bribe of 20 crowns and report back to Willis that they were unable to find the culprit and I'd wager the vast majority will choose to turn him in. After all, positive moral choices, the good karma option, have always proven to be the most popular with gamers. Bioware's John Ebinger, who worked on the Mass Effect series, said that somewhere around 92% of players chose the Paragon option in their game at any given moment. People are mostly hardwired to do the right thing, and here it certainly seems like an open and shut case. Nap did destroy the forge, and it's therefore only fair that he suffers the consequences of his actions. Except, when Nap is turned in and Willis reports his crimes to the Nilf Guardians, they immediately decide that Nap is to be hung, which doesn't seem like a very reasonable punishment. Granted, Nat's behaviour was poor, but is losing his life for it really fair comeuppance? On the other hand, if players don't turn Nap in, it saves the man's life, but Willis ultimately receives no justice for Nap's crimes, which Nap absolutely should have been punished for. And this is why Twisted Firestarter is such an ingenious inclusion so early on in The Witcher 3. The game wants players to understand that choosing what looks like the morally correct decision, the good option, won't always lead to the most positive outcome, if there is a positive outcome at all. And nowhere is this demonstrated more clearly than in this quest. Players may have done what they thought was the right thing, but in the end, a young man lost his life in what many would argue were very unjust circumstances. By placing this quest right at The Witcher 3's beginning, CD Projekt Red clearly demonstrates to players that not everything in this world will end well. They want players to understand that they need to stop and really think about the consequences of their actions, that they shouldn't just pick the one that sounds good because that's what they're used to doing in every other game. Players learning this now is so important because it's so vital to the effectiveness of The Witcher 3's storytelling as a whole. Other choice-based games, like Mass Effect, usually make it obvious which choice is the good one and which choice is the bad one, and their storytelling suffers as a result. Because players are given such clear indicators as to which is which, they often end up choosing their action based not on context or the expected consequence, but instead on what is the perceived best option. Whereas, because there's no clear choice in The Witcher 3, players have to think a lot harder about why they're actually choosing a certain course of action, and this results in quests which consistently feel so much more involved than the ones offered in almost any other game out there. Sure, they may not be that different in terms of gameplay, go here, talk to someone, maybe kill something or search for an item, but because they push players to pay much more attention to each individual story, they are a million times more impactful as a result. Essentially, Twisted Firestarter is an early attempt by CD Projekt Red to break behaviours which have been ingrained so deeply over time by games which have come before, and I think it does a fantastic job of that. Twisted Firestarter may be my personal favourite of the side quests involved in White Orchard, but the quality remains high throughout. Missing in Action is one that sits well alongside Twisted Firestarter because it continues to demonstrate just how different an outcome quests can have depending on player choice. Players meet Dune Vildenvert outside a ransacked village, and the man asks for help in tracking down his brother, who was lost on a nearby battlefield. After taking down several ghouls and utilising Witcher Sense, players soon enough find Dune's brother Bastion lying wounded in a nearby cabin alongside an Guardian soldier named Rosin. Bastion wants to bring Rosin back to their home so he can live a life away from the war, although this would of course make Rosin a deserter in the process. 
Dune, on the other hand, isn't so sure that housing a deserter is a good idea, and so the choice is ultimately left up to Geralt, for some reason. It's a choice that demonstrates how futile the wars waged by the rich are, and the terrible toll they take on those forced to fight in them. Despite being the ones who are being used, it still takes some convincing for the poor to help each other, even if they're ultimately all being made to suffer in the same way, regardless of which side they're actually on. In the end, players can choose to convince Dune to let the Nilfgaardian join them, or leave him there to die. Again, CD Projekt Red deserves a lot of praise here. Even this smaller quest has a great set of consequences attached to it, and it highlights their commitment to complexity from the very outset. White Orchard could have just featured numerous uninteresting fetch quests to get players acquainted with its world, but instead, there's clearly been a great deal of thought put into every single detail right from the outset. And speaking of details, remember the items I mentioned Jennifer dropping during the opening cutscene? Well, if players look hard enough, they can even find those on the battlefield they recently searched as part of Missing in Action. I wanted to quickly touch on this as it's another reason why White Orchard is such an incredible part of the Witcher 3 experience. Tutorials are so often completely closed off from the rest of the game's world, but here so much of what the player does, or what happens around them, has a lasting effect beyond these initial few hours, which goes a long way to making it feel like a part of the wider game. If players choose to save Rosin during Missing in Action, for example, they can find him later working in the fields nearby. And likewise, if players return to Willis later on having turned Nap in, they'll find his forge has been rebuilt, but he's now struggling for custom and will have to move elsewhere as the townspeople hate him. It makes the events in White Orchard feel meaningful, even if they are largely separate from the bulk of the game. The area no longer feels like a place you spend a few hours in before it's forgotten, forever suspended in time, but one that instead still holds some value for the most curious of players who really do want to experience everything they possibly can while playing the game. While the number of side quests in White Orchard is dwarfed by that of the rest of the game, a great deal of thought has nonetheless been put into the rest of them as well, and they all serve a purpose. Precious Cargo, for example, follows the same pattern as many of the quests in The Witcher 3. Talk to someone to get more detail about the quest, use detective mode to progress, and then, depending on the option chosen, engage in combat at the end. But crucially, this quest also serves to teach players that even those who hand out quests can't necessarily be trusted. If Twisted Firestarter demonstrated to players that they need to think beyond their immediate choice and about what the consequences of that could actually be, then Precious Cargo demonstrates that even the initial information they receive may well not be entirely, if at all, true. Likewise, Devil in the Well acts as a teachable moment as well. The quest is the first of many Witcher contracts players will take on during the course of the game, and so CD Projekt Red takes extra care to include checking the bestiary as part of the actual quest objectives. It gives players a taste of what is to come, but also makes it clear that in order to be most effective against the various beasts, spectres and vampires they'll encounter during their travels, checking the bestiary is vital. And again, story-wise this quest is also very well written. It's the sad tale of a young couple fleeing the lord of their village, before eventually he takes revenge, sent into a rage by the death of his son. Even the smallest of side quests, like a frying pan spick and span, has a purpose in that it shows there are connections to be made to characters not yet seen but previously featured in the series, should they look hard enough. In this case, through letters almost certainly written by Spymaster Thaler, who was featured in the first game in the series. And last, but certainly not least, White Orchard also features a number of treasure hunts, which are used to introduce the concept to players in a smaller area than they'll be used in later on. Here, players can get used to the idea without spending quite as much time travelling between locations as they will do later on in the game. It's not the most gripping of content, but it's nonetheless sensible that they're included in White Orchard, and this decision again aligns with the design philosophy CD Projekt Red adopted of making every single part of The Witcher 3 as easy to digest for players as possible. Beyond the side quests, the other thing White Orchard also offers plenty of is points of interest for those willing to explore off the beaten track. They're, again, not particularly exciting in and of themselves, and are no different from those you'll arguably find too many of spread across the rest of The Witcher 3, but they help fill up the map and give players an opportunity to tackle all the different types before moving on to somewhere larger. And speaking of maps, I want to touch very briefly on the way White Orchard is laid out. Granted, there's not a whole lot to say, but I think the way it's designed, with the town slap bang in the middle, makes the map feel vast, but not too daunting. By placing the town in the middle, there's always a central hub for players to return to or pass through on their travels from one side to the other, which helps break things up and makes the area as a whole feel far more manageable. Having learnt the ropes by taking on various side quests and exploring as many points of interest as possible, learning more about the world at large in the process, it's finally time for players to get back to what is perhaps the most important objective in White Orchard, killing the Griffin. The quest starts off simply enough. Players visit an Elf Guardian general, who Geralt interrupts while he's dealing with one of the locals in a surprisingly considered manner. Look at my hands. Look, 
See the calluses? These are not the hands of an excellency, but of a farmer. So we speak peasant to peasant. How much can you give? Forty bushels. There'd be more, sir, but our lads, the Temerians, that is, took from us earlier and... You will give thirty, and that will do. Let us settle on it, and I wish to see the transport soon. Oh, thank you, sir. After all the doom and gloom surrounding the Nilfgaardians, much of it perhaps justified, it's a nice touch that this scene is thrown in to demonstrate that much like some of the side quests, things aren't always black and white, good or bad, there's usually always shades of grey as well. Once players finish questioning the captain, there's two objectives to tackle, finding out from a local hunter where a group of Nilfgaardian soldiers were slain, and talking to a herbalist about concocting bait to lure the griffin in. Meeting the hunter is interesting enough in terms of mechanics, and wisely includes a section where players need to use their Witcher sense. Remember, after all, that there could be some players who haven't completed any side quests before this point, and so still need to get reacquainted with a mechanic they may not have used in a while, but will soon be required to use much, much more. But what is particularly well executed here is another teachable moment for players, one that The Witcher 3 is very keen for them to understand ahead of moving out into the wider world. Sometimes beasts can be bad, but humans can be worse. It turns out the griffin stalking the area is so enraged because his mate was killed by an Ilfgaardian patrol. Given that griffins mate for life, I'd say the griffin's reaction was justified. It's fair to say many humans would react in a similar way if their partner was killed for no particular reason. This part of the quest doesn't just demonstrate that humans can be bad, it goes so far as to show that it could even be humans who are the ones at fault in the first place. The griffin is essentially used to humanise the beasts of the Witcher 3, to suggest that sometimes there may be a sympathetic side to them, and the griffin's situation even mirrors Geralt's. Like the griffin, he experiences hostility as an outsider too, which begs the question, do humans consider him to be one of their own, or simply another beast? Next, players meet the herbalist and go on a hunt for Buckthorn before meeting Vesemir back at the tavern. Even here, The Witcher 3 continues to ensure players are properly introduced to all the mechanics they'll need moving forwards, instructing them to brew the Thunderbolt potions so they have a working knowledge of the alchemy system. It's then time to head out into the wild, put down bait, and fight the griffin. The crossbow is also introduced as a weapon at this point as well, used to bring down the griffin when it takes to the air, and this is the final mechanic players are introduced to before it's time to move on. Once the griffin has finally been slain and Geralt has taken its head for a trophy, there's little left to do in White Orchard. Another side quest, however, is introduced on Death's Bed, and even though players are nearly at the end of their time in the area, the game is still opening up new things to players. This quest sets up a moral quandary about whether to give a witcher potion to a girl poisoned by the griffin, but what it's really there to do is push players towards crafting the swallow potion, one which will be incredibly important to have on hand throughout the rest of the game. After a final chat with Vesemir and one more disagreement with the locals, the story of the Griffin in White Orchard finally concludes, as does what I consider to be The Witcher 3's opening, as Yennefer arrives flanked by an Ilfgaardian escort to take Geralt to the Emperor. And what an opening it is! Long enough to be a standalone game in its own right and packed full of well thought out content for players to discover, The Witcher 3's introduction is better developed than some entire games. But what will always stick out most for me is the way it slowly introduces players to its world, its story and its gameplay mechanics, opening up more and more as players progress. It's elegant, every little bit of it makes sense in the way it's designed, and it's indicative of the level of attention to detail CD Projekt Red commits to not only during The Witcher 3's opening, but through an experience which can easily hit the 100 hour mark by its conclusion. There may be some of you watching out there who aren't fans of role-playing games, who find them overly complex and too reliant on story, but if there's one game I think could change your mind purely through the way it handles its first few hours, it's The Witcher 3. It's a dazzling example of how an introduction should be done, and one that I think will stick in most players' minds for a long, long time after they've finished it. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do consider subscribing to the channel, and hopefully I'll see you again soon.